Uh, there's the 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 world famous one in Alabama, and I guess maybe just as famous as is the one out in Oklahoma. So they've they're out there practicing, and um, yeah. and we're gonna have Stephen come on because Stephen uh, uh, talks about the chatterbait. A lot of you guys like me are chatterbait aficionados, uh, but Stephen's taking it to a new level. And this year at Bass University, he gave us a seminar about how he uses this. Uh, this technique 24 7 12 months a year all the different types of blades that uh, and trailers and all the things that he uses to be effective with it so uh it's really going to be a uh, an interesting show that i think relates to a lot of guys because we love that bait such an amazing fish catcher so um so look for that we're going to be bringing steven on here in in just a minute we've got a lot of other things that we're going to be talking about today we just come off the ike foundation uh, tournament down on the Chesapeake, which is an annual event that uh, we love to participate in here at Bash U. Everybody's everybody's involved. I fished it with my son Jake, and we had a blast. And uh, you know, just every everybody else was was part of that. And congratulations to the Cowans uh, who won big with 22 pounds, uh, which was was awesome. They won a brand new Bass Cat with a Yamaha, and uh, just an, an amazing win on a kind of a stingy Chesapeake for June, honestly. It was a little bit tricky. So um, the weights so were all over the place. The weights were all over the place. Jake and I were happy to have, uh, you know, our four. We were happy to have our four. And, uh, I heard Jake caught them all. <laughs> I got to be honest, Jake Jake was the high hook. He came out of the gate swinging with our, with our big bass of the day. So, um so that was it was a lot of fun and we're we're going to dive into that a little bit. We are brought to you by Tackle Direct Studios. Talking to you from Tackle Direct Studios, guys. We've got uh if you're watching us over on social, uh don't forget to like and share the feed and uh we got a prize for you as well as a grand prize. So pay attention, Mr. Allen. Uh He's the Dan Allen prize. The Dan and the Dan. We got to get a Dan Allen trophy, like with a big picture of his face on we it. We do. That's, uh, you've earned it. You've earned it. He's tough to beat, guys. So you better be taking notes and paying attention because that's what we do. We're going to dive into the details here at Bash U. And of course, you hear Jocelyn's uh, voice over there. Hi, Josh. So Hello. glad. So glad you're with us today. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. We had, uh, we had a few technical glitches and, um, we are our Riz is is on site. He's out at Spirit Lake, Iowa, right now, collecting some uh, some stuff for Bash University, mm -hmm. and as along with Jeff, wishing you guys well out there, working with the folks at Humminbird and Minkota, and uh, look forward to uh, look forward to seeing how things are going out there. I think the that that lake has a, a reputation for for having monsters, and uh, and we have Justin Harant with us as well you didn't fish this weekend you that that was a big sacrifice you you, you volunteered to help that's awesome i did it was tough but <laughs> it was awesome to help out the kids and uh big shout out to all the ladies from the ike foundation that really do a good job putting on the whole event and everything like that Thank you for sacrificing yeah, fishing. No problem. Anytime. <laughs> yep. Thank Because Justin, Justin's a stick. He's a hammer down there on the Chesapeake. Everybody around here fishes that body of water all the time. Justin, uh, Justin can get it done down there. So, um, so anyway, we're, uh, we've got all this stuff going on. We're going to take a quick commercial break and, uh, We've got great prize. What are our prizes today, Josh? Uh, for our like and share, we have our Waterwood custom bait. And for our grand prize, we have some chatter baits and some Cortland line. Excellent. Excellent. Cortland line. We put it to work. Uh, Jake and I did uh, this weekend, both in our frog fishing and then, and, and also in our stick bait fishing. So uh, am amazing line. And you guys got to go check that out. You can pick it up right through. If you're a subscriber to Bash U, make sure you go check that out. Uh, you, we've got a great discount uh, and can get you into some amazing braided line that I think you're really going to like. Uh, we also have going on right now oh, yeah, is our Father's Day promotion. Mm -hmm. And if you have not uh, subscribed, it's a, it's really a great time right now. If you want to buy a gift, look, we, we if you have somebody in your life that fish, you know how it is. They always get, I get the Billy Bass. I have five of them, 10 of them. <laughs> 
that have been gifted to me. Um, a million things that are the, you know, the, the brands that I don't like or use or whatever it may be. This, I guarantee you, will be a gift that the angler in your life uh, will love. It, it is Bash University. It's the gift of education, the gift of learning. Uh, you can subscribe at BashU.tv. And we have the Frog Days of Summer Father's Day special going on. So we're going to hook you up with a couple of Spro Frogs as well as a Bash University hat to give uh, or keep, get it for yourself, uh, as well as a $25 coupon at Tackle Direct to use as you will. Amazing uh, gift for a Father's Day gift uh, for somebody in your life that you know loves the bass fish. Uh, if you don't have a subscription and you're a father, tell whoever it is that's what you want and get yourself uh, or gift it get, for yourself. Or gift it for, gift it for yourself. Justin's getting it for himself. <laughs> Now's the time. Now's the time. So, guys, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to bring on Stephen Browning. We're going to be talking about chatterbaits and the power of positive thinking. Uh, and he's going to be on uh, right after this. And... Cortland Line Master Braid, America's premium super braided fishing line. Manufactured in our Cortland, New York facility and constructed from the highest quality spectra fibers available. Cortland Line Company, made in America since 1915. I have to have the best eyewear. My eyes are essential to doing my job. It's the highest quality lens that I've ever used. Top of the line performance in these glasses. But they're priced for absolutely everyone. The everyday angler can afford them. As a touring professional pro, if I can depend on them, I know the weekend angler can as well. Hobie eyewear, built for the pros. Price for everyone. What's going on? It's Riz here from the Bash University, and I am excited to welcome in Waterwood Custom Baits to the Bashu family. These are custom handmade baits in the south rainforest of Brazil. They're made of Marupa Pedra wood. It's extremely dense, it's resistant, but it's also really buoyant. They're made of quality components with a 100% guarantee. They're made for tournament anglers, to get it done when the money is on the line. Guys, that was like my second cast with this bait. That's a Waterwood custom bait. These things are handmade in the rainforest south of Brazil. And I mean, as you can see right here, it's a fish catching bait. It's got the front hook. That means they wanted it. This bait's, uh, it, it's running really true. It throws really well. Guys, check them out at waterwoodcustombaits.com. underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for. Catch more fish. Have more fun. Aquaview. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rods? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That are made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick, every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out during a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I found that can withstand my hook set. Boom goes the dynamite. On the water, not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minkota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. 
products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together, the One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Love that Humminbird commercial. Our boys are on site right now uh, working with uh, their amazing products. Uh, I love the 360. I can't tell you how much I use 360 in my tournament this weekend. It's so important in that shallow grass that we fish all the time to, to be able to see where those edges are. And uh, what, what, an, what an important and amazing tool. You got to check it out if you, if you don't have it already. Um, Without any further ado, let's let's bring him in. We've got Stephen Browning with us. He's coming to us live from the Bassmaster Open practice round. Uh, man, I hate that we're eating into your practice time today, Steve. Well, uh, something needs to be eaten because the fish tanks sure aren't right now, so uh, it's all good, <laughs> Pete. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Yeah, this well, see this might play right into your hands, right? You know, you take a, pr a break, you get a reset. And get that that positive uh, attitude that you teach us about at Bash U. This could be perfect for you. That that's exactly right. That may be you may be exactly what I needed. This is perfect timing. Perfect timing. Well, that's awesome. It looks beautiful out there. Uh, we are, um, you know, we just released. We we work. We're so I'm so glad to work with you. You know, you and I have known each other uh, forever, uh, and I was I was. At your seminar, uh, you made your first classic in 97, and uh, that was my first classic was in 1997. So we uh, we kind of been running parallel careers there, or at least we did for a little while, you know? Yeah, and, you know, uh, you, you were the smart one. You decided to, to take a little different avenue, and I kept going down that straight old path and out here chasing these silly fish. So, uh, you know, some of us are smarter than others. Now, I'll, I'll tip my hat to you, Pete. <laughs> oh, please. I tip my hat to you because you know what? I still I fish the opens because I still love this stuff, you know, like that. That amazing. There's there's a rush that comes along with like trying to trying to identify the pattern and that that solving that puzzle and that hunt. And uh, there's just nothing like it. And, you know, and and then in those few rare times when you actually have your arms around it for just a little while. It's it's got to be one of the, it's for me it's the greatest feeling in the world. It really is, and uh, for those of th that have followed my career over the years, they know that these opens have been a very very vital part of my career. And uh, you know, I've, I've made the classic several times through those through the opens. Uh, you know, and and it's just you know I I I like hanging out with these guys. I mean they. they you know, they're just like I was 30 years ago. I mean, they, they have a dream of, of doing this full time and, and this is where you start. And, uh, you know, I have just I just enjoy hanging out around the guys that compete on the opens because they they truly do have fire in their blood and they you know, they want it. I mean, they really do. You can see it uh, at last year's one of the opens last year. I managed to squeak into the cut. And uh, and I looked around and the the faces looked like they were all teenagers to me. <laughs> uh, and I, I I imagine you when you and I made those cuts when we were young. I imagine the the Cluns and the Browers were looking at us like that. Like who are these young bucks coming in? But uh, the the tide is turned. <laughs> You're extremely right. You know the thing about it is I keep up with a lot of these kids, and I call them kids because they're fresh out. Some of them are fresh out of college. Uh, some of them are fresh out of high school. You know, I have a 21 year old son and, and, uh, you know, I see, I've seen a lot of these, these young youngsters that I'm going to be competing against this year or this week. 
you know, throughout the course of the last four or five years, you know, you know, watching Bo and being a part of his uh, young career. So uh, I know a lot of these guys. I know that they can catch them, and uh, they're pretty sure they're not scared of me any whatsoever. <laughs> I don't believe that's true. I think I think they are intimidated by by you as as they should be. I mean, your body of work is is a big one, but you're. Uh, we we had to do something for us uh, that I really loved, which is taking on a, a bait uh, that you have really owned. You know, you have just taken full possession of that technique and and learned probably more about it than anybody I know. And uh, and and that's available, by the way, guys. That seminar for you guys that are subscribed, it's available right now over at Bashy.tv. I want to. Uh, it, it's a must watch. For uh, for guys that are chatterbait guys, it's a must watch. For guys that don't have confidence in that technique yet, uh, you want to definitely go check that out because you you've done something, man. You locked that bait into your hand, uh, man, for a long time. You learned a lot about it. Well, I you know I, I when I I, I want to say it was like two thousand five or six. I uh, I was kind of introduced to the chatterbait, and it was up on Gunnersville Lake, and uh, I, I'd caught some fish on one in, during practice, and it was a very specific color, very specific trailer. Everything I, I tried other colors, I tried other trailers, I tried everything, and the, the fish just wanted that one particular chatterbait. I had like two, so I called Z-Man. And uh, Daniel Nussbaum actually overnighted me a half a dozen of them of that specific kind. And that was the original chatterbait. And uh, it just, from that moment on, I just fell in love with it. I really did. It is a bait that I can, that you feel with, you know, you feel the whole cast uh, on the retrieve. Uh, And over the years, I've just tried to, you know, make my equipment, get my equipment to the perfect, you know, setup. And, and, uh, you know, I talked to, I talked to the guys there when we were, uh, down in Athens, Texas about, you know, making sure that you have the right setup because with the wrong setup, not only do, do you not feel the bait, you know, and the, and the fish eating the bait, the way, you know, it's designed to, to be fished, it just, you know, it, it takes so much away from it. You get discouraged and you put it down. And uh, I just encouraged all, all the guys and, and girls that were there about keeping it in your hand, but making sure that you do have the right setup because it does make all the difference in the world. Well, let's dive in there because you did, you gave up your setup and it's, you talk about it at length, how important it is. Uh, not not just being able to make the bait do what you want it to, but man, as important as anything, uh, landing those fish uh, consistently. Yeah, you know that the big deal is, you know, chatterbait fishing is a lot like deep cranking. You, I hear David Fritz, and I'm sure he's he's mentioned it to you guys a lot. It's when that crankbait starts coming up, you know, even though it's down there in 12, 15 feet of water, a lot of time that's when you get get a bite. It's very similar to a chatterbait. You get, I get a lot of bites, like what you know we refer to as short stringing, and you know you may only have eight, ten feet of line out, and that fish, you know, comes to bite it, and it's because that bait is rising to the surface, and uh, you know it's it's like it's trying to get away from that fish, and that's when you get, you know, a lot of the bites, and uh, you know without the right rod, without the right reel, without the right line, you know you can take it away from one and uh you know or or not even be aware that that fish even bit and that's that's so key is uh is a proper setup for sure and you're using a, a saint croix like it, it's a seven two I, right it is it's a seven two heavy moderate and uh I, every every chatterbait rod that i throw i throw a seven two heavy moderate as well as a seven ten heavy moderate and an extra heavy moderate just the the big deal is it's whether or not i need to make very precise cast or i can just 
fling it and wing it, you know, and, and the longer rods are, are what I use when I'm like fishing over grass and just, just trying to cover a lot of water. The shorter rod is the one that I need to make that pinpoint cast. And, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the one that I use, uh, most of the time, 16, 14 and 16 pound, uh, fluorocarbon line. I just feel like that's, that's the deal. I use gamma and, uh, the speed of the reel, in my opinion, makes a big, big difference. And, and I use a seven, five to one lose tournament pro. I've been using it for, uh, really exclusively since about 2019. Uh, I'd won it on Ross Barnett throwing a, throwing a jack hammer and that particular tournament. And uh, I told the guys and girls this in the seminar that after day one, I, I knew I had the right bait. I just did not have the right setup. And, uh, when I got back to the hotel and, uh, I, I don't know, I was probably in the, maybe in the thirties. And, uh, I told my wife, I said, I feel like I still have a chance to win this event. I just have to dial in these rods and these reels, the line size. And uh, on that particular one, I went to a 710 heavy moderate uh, because I was making long cast. And, uh, you know, when the fish bit the bait way out, I had a 6'4 to 1. I could not keep up with the fish. And you see that a lot, especially when you're fishing in shallow water. It's very hard to keep up with that fish. And, uh, I went to the seven five. I went to a sixteen pound line instead of fourteen pound line. The longer rod, and everything started started working. On day two, I moved up into the top ten, and then on the final day, I caught caught two feet, two five pounders right there at the end of the day, which uh, you know gave me the victory. And it was all because of setup. And uh, had I just gone back out that day, or the day two of the tournament. And not changed up, I promise you that that blue trophy would not be sitting at my house right now. That's well, that's an amazing adjustment. And you're you're right about catching up to them. Um, why do you think that is? Like I always had the theory that they're hitting this bait from behind and like coming right at you in that shallow water. Is, is that right? I, there's no doubt. And, uh, you know, the big deal is, is, is when they got a head of steam and they bite, I mean, they just bite, they go down just a little bit. You set the hook and they're, I mean, they're wide open. And it, and it, <laughs> like I said, it, it is so hard to keep up with them with a, uh, with a slower retrieve reel that it, it's, you're going to get discouraged. And like I said, you're going to set the bait down and that's the biggest mistake you can make. Yeah, you got you got to keep you got to keep running that bait. I'm holding one of the uh, what's that? I just laugh him. He's, <laughs> he's been playing with the chatterbait as you were talking. I know. I, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the original chatterbait. Of course, there there have been uh, there's been some changes and modifications, and then the jackhammer has come out. What 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 do you think the changes that have been made to the bait over the years? What what I mean that jackhammer is a little different. What what has made this bait even better as they've made these changes? You know, once you once you start getting into a little bit higher price point, you start changing the the blade is the same, but you start getting better components. The snap on them are, are a little higher quality snap. The hooks are a little higher quality hooks. Uh, you got uh, you know little trailers. Uh, keepers on these baits, and uh, I'll just tell you guys, I, I, we're going to introduce a new one at ICAST. I think everybody's going to really, really like. Uh, it's one that I've been working on for probably about a year, uh -oh. year and a half now, and uh, I, I'm excited to bring it to the table. It's going to fall in between the original jackhammer and the, um, I mean, the original chatterbait and the jackhammer as far as, far as price point, but we have We've made some changes that I think will keep this bait in people's hands. Just, just, it just is a pretty cool little deal, little project that we've been working on. But um, you can see Pete's eye glowing. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? What? I, oh, you have my attention, Mr. Brownie. Well, you, the big thing is this you know, what's one of the most frustrating things about a chatterbait is that it's not weedless any whatsoever but it catches fish around wood big time. 
And, uh, you know, most people pick up a spinnerbait, throw it around wood because it comes over the wood right. You know, it comes through there better. Me personally, I would rather throw a chatterbait. So I went to work and uh, made a few changes to, uh, you know, to one that, that I really think will will help guys, you know, be able to pick it up and throw it, you know, whenever we're, uh, whenever you're around wood and it'll, it'll eliminate the majority of that snagging and uh, frustration for sure. Man, I uh, gotta have it. Gotta have it. Now the, uh, we, we've, we've had, um, Terry Scroggins came on the show and I don't know if you know Terry well, but, I know but he's, very a, well. <laughs> he's a tinkerer, you know, he's got to modify everything. And yeah. he had a really cool uh, modification where he drilled holes into the jackhammer and put 200, you know, pound test mono or fluoro on there as weed guards, you know? Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the the weed making those baits weedless is, uh, it, you know, it, around wood. That's a, that's an amazing asset. So, well, I can't wait to see what you come out with. Uh, we're, we're definitely uh, going to come down and take a look. That's for sure. But well, let's you know, questioning how is a chatter bait for wood? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's that's the problem, Jocelyn. They they pick one up, they get hung up two or three times, and they set it down. And uh, you know, I talked to the guys and girls there at the, at the B Bass U about proper uh having your rod angle mm-hmm. at, a, at, at the proper uh you know angle. The deal is if you will point your rod tip. Anytime I get around wood and you'll notice, I point my rod tip at that piece of wood that I'm bringing that bait over. The deal is, is when that bait hits, you, if you have your rod to the side, it allows that rod to load up. You do not want that rod to load up. You want that bait perfectly in line with your, with your rod. And when the bait hits, instead of that rod loading up and, and, not allow, and that bait turning to one side, it hits and it bounces straight up and over. And uh, that's just, you know, one of the, one of the few things that, you know, I told the class there that, that uh, I've actually gotten uh, DMs over the past three or four months and guys just, I mean, they can't believe how well, you know, they're able to fish it, especially through heavier cover. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great tip. Uh, And, you know, I know I use the, the cross eye too, the, the, they make a, a weedless version that I have uh, that I've been playing around with because we fish a lot of blowdown. Every well, every blowdown trees exist on every body of water on the planet. Brush pile, right? Um, such an important thing. I want to ask you this, and, and a lot some of these questions are coming from uh, from Riz, uh, Rich Ledbeater, who's not here, uh, who is a jackhammer, um, you know, addict, <laughs> like enthusiast. yeah, he's enthusiast. He's not yeah, he's he's upset. I had to make him travel to uh to spirit lake today but uh i bet he's got one in his hand what do you bet <laughs> I, I i bet that's true i hear that lake's pretty good out there too yeah. but um he one of his questions was which i think is a really pertinent one i know you fish it all the time what 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 is the situation where you're like you know what i this is i'm putting the chatterbait down this is not a chatterbait situation <sighs> Well, I mean, you know, you have to kind of kind of take each fishery, you know, uh, kind of analyze it on each fishery basis. You know, there's not a fishery in the country that they will not buy the chatterbait. Is the chatterbait the best bait? Sometimes no. And, uh, you know, as an angler, you just have to realize those times. And, and sometimes you just have to sit it down. Uh I'll be honest with you guys, I keep two or three on my deck all the time. The deal is I'm going to pick them up and throw them throughout the day of competition, practice, or whatever it may be, just to keep the fish honest. Fish don't do the same thing every day. Their feeding patterns differ, differentiate every day. So don't think just because you didn't catch them on it today, they may not eat it tomorrow. So, um, I mean, like I said, there's three on my deck or three in my box at all times. Well, I I appreciate that. And you also talked about in your seminar that uh, you're – and I haven't. You know, I have all these, but I have not incorporated them yet. 
but there's two that you really like, which are the the big blade, the oversized blade, and uh, and the willow blade. Uh, tell 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 me a little. Tell us a little bit about when you're going to be using those blades. We're out here in Oklahoma, and I you got about I don't know maybe three or four inches of visibility. I've got the I've got the big blade tied it on uh, yesterday when I got here and saw the water clarity and uh, it's just a deal where I use the big blade a lot where where you would normally use like a single Colorado bladed spinnerbait uh, you need a lot of thump you need a lot of vibration uh, dingy water situations as well as cold water applications like truly cold like in a you know in the mid mid 40s say low to mid 40s up to about 50 degrees i use that big bladed chatterbait and i fish it slow uh I, I, and what i mean by slow it's like a slow rolling presentation and uh the big blade really kind of makes that bait rise a little bit more and um you know a lot of times you you need to keep it down you know 18 inches underneath the surface and guys i want to tell you something I, i've caught fish in in 40 degree water and two feet of water you know, it's, they don't, they don't just, you know, abandon where they're, you know, where they're living. I mean, not, not all fish go out deep in the summer, not all fish go out deep in the wintertime. And, uh, and I'm just, I'm just more comfortable shallow fishing. And that's when I use that big blade. And, uh, you know, the, the willow blade is, a, we call it the willow vibe. Anytime that I get around fish that are schooling, uh you know that are feeding on those little bitty bait fish that's when that one just really shines clear super clear water uh that bait shines very very much so and uh you know it's 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 some that they may not be on my deck at all times but they're within hand's reach i can promise you well there are two there are two baits that i've got to i've got to find uh, some, I got to use them. I, I just, you know, right. I got to incorporate them into my fishing and I just haven't done it yet, but you've inspired me to do that. And I know a lot of others, uh, as well. And we've got, uh, we've got a lot of people watching on bash you and, and on social Jocelyn, I'm going to throw it to you for a question for Steven. Steven, how do you determine what weight chatterbait to use? Andre would like to know. Good question. Andre. Yeah, that is a great question. You know, pretty basically, uh, three sizes, three eighths, half, and a three quarter. Anytime that I'm fishing in three feet or less, and I'm, and I want to just kind of a moderate retrieve, I'm going to use a three eighths ounce. If I get down to three to five feet of water, now this is water underneath the boat, not, not directly on, you know, what I'm casting. It's water underneath my boat, what I'm looking at on my Lawrence unit. If it's three to five, I'm on about the half if it's five or deeper i'm about the three quarter and uh, again it's just if, if i that's not to say that i may not tie on a half in three feet of water and burn it and you know if i feel like the fish are, are very active but most of the time three eighths to three half to five and three quarter anything deeper than five Varying your weights. It's it's super key, Justin. Uh, I know some guys are watching on social. What what do you got? Yeah, so first I just want to give a shout out to Howie, Blake, Talk, Mr. Hicks for <laughs> all bringing in some questions. Uh, one question we're getting is, what's your go-to trailer for back of a jackhammer? 90% of the time on, on I use a razor shads and uh, the razor shad is just a, a slim profile fluke style profile. And uh, the reason I use it is it doesn't tear up and it's, it's got that real tight wiggling. So, I mean, I like to, my retrieve is fairly fast, but I wouldn't say extremely fast uh, most of the time. And that little, just that little tight wiggle uh, that the razor shads, puts out is is to me is just right um if i need to slow the bait down a little bit i'll throw the diesel minnows or if the if the um you know water clarity is a little dingy like like we have here in oklahoma i'll throw the diesel minnows and that's that's what i'm using this week here on um on lake ufala is the diesel minnows well let me ask you this will will the chatterbait play a role 
uh, in this week's Open? Mm, it will, if Stephen Browning's anywhere close to the uh, top of the leaderboard, <laughs> I promise you it will be. I, uh, <laughs> yes, it, it, you know it, it's it should. I would I would think that if you're if you don't have at least one of them tied on, then, then somebody that y'all are looking at is probably going to beat them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you better have one tied on. <laughs> nice well, question, I, Pete. <laughs> I um I want to switch gears for just a minute. Um and we're going to let you go. I'm going to let you get back to practicing, but you're you're famous for your uh your attitude and it's uh it, it it's impressive and I said this to you when we were together down in Texas. It's just it's amazing to watch in the face of adversity how how you're able to just be so mentally strong, mentally tough in those situations and that's such an important part of this game isn't it 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 really is you know some of the best tournaments that i've had over the course of my career are are what we would call grinding tournaments where man you just go out there and you just grind out five bites or the weather is absolutely crappy and you know guys are just bummed out because of that and i'm I've always had the attitude, control what you can control. And uh, and if you cannot control it yourself, man, don't even, don't let that influence what you're doing. Um, you know, it just to me is your attitude is, is, is everything on the water, off the water, just in life in general. And, uh, you know, I've always tried to keep a smile on my face. I do because you know, we're not, we're not guaranteed tomorrow guys. And, and it's like, why in the world are you going to waste a second, you know, being negative? I mean, there's so much negativity in this world. There's plenty of it out there. Just don't get trapped by it because it can run your world in a heartbeat and run your day, run your tournament. It can just, it can, it's, it's horrible. And um, I just, I just try to try my best not to let any negative enter my mind, enter my thoughts, enter my my actions. And uh, if you do that, I promise you, man, it's it just life can be life what is you make it, trust me. And if you want it to be super, you, you can't control that. That's great advice and and you know we you know, Gerald Swindle is, has the, his positive mental attitude seminar over at Bash U. And, uh, and I, I want to invite you guys to listen in to Steven's uh, seminar uh, that, that he delivered for us in Texas, which is, is all about the mental, the mental game and his, his mental approach. And it's, it's really, honestly, it, after watching and listening to it again, uh, it's, it's, it's life lessons in that seminar which uh, which I think are so valuable. It's awesome that you shared all that with us. Well, it's, you know, two, two guys have, have contacted me since that seminar, and, uh, and both of them are having, like, the best year that they have had in a long, long time on the water. And, and both of them made, made comments that, you know, when things are, are not going the way they think they should – they just stop, take a few deep breaths, sit down and just and and get that stuff out of their mind. And, uh, you know, that's that's what you just have to do. You just can't let little things bother. You can't let big things bother. You can't let the things that you have no control over dictate, you know, the outcome of your day. And, uh, you know, so I'm 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 all like I said, dudes, I, I, I mean, I love smiling. I mean, I really do. I got wrinkles on my face. I've smiled so much over the years, but I'm going to keep on smiling. I can promise you. Well, you're, you're an inspiration and, uh, and I appreciate you taking some of your practice time to spend with us and the Bass University family. And, and we're going to be rooting for you out there this week. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, and, and thanks for everybody for watching and the questions and all. It, it really means a lot. I mean, you know, Pete, you guys have been a big inspiration to me over the years, and, and 
you know, I can, I, I still, every time I think about Cayuga Lake, I remember Pete, Pete Clusick beating me up here at Cayuga Lake, but you taught me so much in that. And even though I didn't use it uh, this past week, uh, I, I do remember the little things that you taught me about Cayuga Lake. And, and hopefully one of these days we'll get back up there and I can redeem myself. Well, well, the fish are certainly showed up for Cayuga Lake though. And uh, yes, the giant brown fish there, they, they were a surprise, weren't they? They really were because I think back when, back when you won that event, I don't, I don't really think brown fish were, were much of a uh, player back in those days at the time. No, I mean, I didn't catch any, and I don't know anybody that in the in the top 10 that was keying on them, but uh, of right. course, Dustin Cannell, uh, you know, smashed them up and won with smallmouth. And uh, and then, of course, Adrian Avina uh, just caught 104 pounds or so of smallmouth in four days. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So, yep. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You, you know, bet. taking the opportunity to 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 brag about my my win on Cayuga. That's that's always fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, see, that's uh, positive, Jocelyn. You see how I do? I put positive <laughs> things in Pete's mind, so every, the rest of the day should be really good for him. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> spreading the love. I right. I appreciate it. Well, we're sending it right back to you, and wish you the best of luck this week. And uh, we look forward to having you at a Bash University real soon. Well, thanks, gang. Appreciate y'all very much. All right, Stephen Browning, everybody, the man, the 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 mental giant of this sport. Mental honestly, giant. I like that. Yeah, he's uh he's he's super. Uh, positive and it comes through in everything that he does and says and uh and we touched on it guys but we've got a surprise guest uh that we are so excited to have and we just mentioned him uh because he caught 104 pounds of smallmouth but we've got adrian avina coming on fresh off of his win at the major league uh tournament on cayuga uh absolutely dwarfing my winning weight the the, the bass are just just giants up there we're going to be talking about uh, how he pulled that off. He's he's one of us. He's one of our Jersey boys. And uh, we're going to be taking a real short break, and we'll be right back to talk with Adrian Avina. Cortland Line Master Braid, America's premium super braided fishing line. Manufactured in our Cortland, New York facility and constructed from the highest quality spectra fibers available. Portland Line Company, made in America since 1915. I have to have the best eyewear. My eyes are essential to doing my job. It's the highest quality lens that I've ever used. Top of the line performance in these glasses. But they're priced for absolutely everyone. The everyday angler can afford them. As a touring professional pro, if I can depend on them, I know the weekend angler can as well. Hobie Eyewear, built for the pros, price for everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to uh, Bass University Live. Kind of abrupt uh, transition there, but we'll take it. Uh, yeah, if you're watching over on social, like and share the feed. We've got a really cool prize. We're going to be giving away some Waterwood crankbaits. And uh, and we also have a great uh, trivia prize. Well, we call it a trivia prize, but basically we we ask a question about what we talked about on today's show. And uh, Dan Allen usually wins it, but can you can can you challenge him? Well, we'll uh, we'll be asking that question here at the end of the show. But I'm I'm really psyched. Uh, we didn't we didn't know that we were going to be able to talk to him today, and I'm so proud of him. Thrilled with a, a just a monster monster win uh, against an incredibly tough field uh on a lake that was fishing off the charts man like just giant giant stringers uh we're so excited to have him with us today he's the jersey boy adrian avina how you doing man uh what is going on guys man it's so so cool to see that big smile brother i know <laughs> i know you've been you've been so close and and been wanting this big trophy for uh for a while but it, that that i can see the smile on your face it's got to feel good yeah i mean absolutely and i've been 
I've been really fortunate, you know, I've had a uh, really consistent career, you know, I mean, uh, it's hard to believe that I've been doing this for about 12 years, but, you know, made a lot of championships, had a lot of top tens, uh, but to finally check a win at a national level off the, uh, off the list of things I'd like to accomplish, man, I mean, it really kind of solidifies what I'm doing as an angler. It, it, it definitely does. I mean, it, you're a strong angler. I mean, there's no doubt. Everybody would give you that credit. Uh, but there, there is something about getting that big win, and you, you room and travel with guys that seem to, to get them like tic tacs. You know? <laughs> Dude, I, it, it's really, it's really incredible, and and uh, I, I mentioned it on stage, but it's, it's not like I'm getting tired of them winning all the time. But <laughs> when they do it week in, week out, and and it's like you know you're inside that top ten too, but you're you're almost just in their shadow. Um, you know, it does get a little tiresome, but it also motivates you and, and, uh, you know, drives you to be better. Uh, but it, it was definitely nice that last week was my week and, and, uh, we were able to, uh, seal the deal on Cayuga. Uh, you know, I think you're right that, that being around that kind of champions, those, that, that kind of success, it, uh, it, I mean, it's, co- it, it's common knowledge, right? That if you want to, uh, if you want to rise, your raise your level you want to surround yourself with people that are that are successful and you've done that and uh and i think that that helps a lot because that when when you get people in the room that expect the that kind of success that, that's influential on you oh there's there's no doubt about it and i mean it's you know, we, uh, we've got a really, really unique deal going on. You know, I mean, uh, you know, that house, you know, Jacob Wheeler, Mark Daniels, Dustin Connell, you know, myself, and we got our camera guys that follow us around, you know, shooting all of our YouTube videos. And it's, it's honestly a family away from our actual family. And, uh, you know, I can honestly say that, you know, if I'm not in the top 10, if I get eliminated from the tournament, you know, I'm rooting for those three guys and, and I know Marty Stone, he kind of hit it. Um, and, and honestly, it got me a little emotional, um, you know, because going into the championship day, for, for those that didn't watch it, I was uh, I was two ounces ahead of Jacob Wheeler. Um, you know, he was two ounces behind. We both caught over 29 pounds of smallmouth. And uh, Marty Dang. said, Adrian, honestly, man, like I know you got all your family here. You got your wife here. You've got, you know, all your sponsors rooting for you. He says, but – I can honestly say from the bottom of my heart, after talking to Jacob, he's rooting for you just as hard as your family is. And that says a lot for a guy that's breathing down my throat in second place. And, and uh, you know, to be able to uh, have a really good championship day and be able to uh, to get that first win, uh, man, it's awesome. And, uh, and I'm, I was glad that, you know, my good buddy was inside the top 10 because, you know, I fish major league fishing because I want to fish against the best. And, you know, he was inside that top 10. Kevin Van Dam was inside that top 10. I got a trash truck that just rolled up. He's picking up my trash, so you might be hearing that right now. But uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was a fun week. Man, that, that you you are fishing against the best. They're just a that was that was a monster top 10. And what what weights? Oh my god. I mean <laughs> I, I just, you know, 29 pounds. You had a 20, what was it, 29 six, I think you had on the on that day or 29, four anyway, that's small mouth. Yep. Uh, and you had a 29 pound bag and you have a two ounce lead on it's crazy, you. crazy. Impossible. Yeah. You get, I got to the, I got to the point. Cause like, you know, a lot of people know, you know, it, it's June, it's, it's the North, you know, the fish are spawning. And, uh, I think it was the first period and I ran through the, a lot of my big ones and um you know in that first period and i caught like 27 or 28 pounds and, and we're talking about in two hours two and a half hours of fishing um you know i call it that giant stringer and then i you know I, i'd ask my official i'm like hey man like you know what's my small fish and he's telling me like a five nine and i'm like holy <laughs> crap like at this point in time like there's not a whole lot of fish i can go to or there's not i mean i got to be really fortunate to try to find one of them you know unicorns that some of them guys were catching some of them seven pounders that cayuga had to really make a difference um but man that just that just kind of showcases on how truly special cayuga is and, and i think it's it's getting better like they had the they had the eight pound state record that was caught there it was it momentarily did. the record or i guess until lake erie broke it soon after 
but um the uh the weights were coming in and, and i've been you know of course you know we're I, we're kind of in the know so we get the word you know all oh, the you know they're catching 25 pound bags of smallmouth up there in the spring and um it's been going on kind of quietly okay. you know and yep. uh and it's just see i i feel like after watching your tournament that it has gotten better and better and better and it's just at its peak yeah i i i definitely agree with you and and uh you know Pete, i mean you fish a lot of these big tournaments i mean you've done it for a really long time and and there's that saying doc talk well I can testify to the whole doc talk thing because I've been doing it for a while now, but I've got, I've got, you know, maybe six or seven guys that I'm really friendly with on the Bass Pro Tour and, and all of us, you know, tend to be younger guys. Um, and we kind of share information, you know, we, we, we talk throughout the event and uh, I can tell you that there was a few fish that were found by these anglers that would have dwarfed anything that was weighed in, but they did leave. Um, so it's just one of them deals where, yeah, wow. like there was multiple seven pounders caught, but I'm talking about fish in the eight pound class that I know for a fact were found, but they weren't weighed in the, in the tournament. Um, and I mean, dude, when you're talking about that kind of quality of a bass, let alone a small mouth, I mean, that's just pure insanity. That is, that is insanity. The, well, that, and it brings, brings up you bring up a point that I heard discussed, uh, during the broadcast and, um, and, and, and I don't know how much you know about it, but it's, it was some, I didn't know this, right. I, I, I love to catch smallmouth. I don't, I haven't spent that much time in the spawn season fishing for them, but what they said was that the females yeah. are only up for a moment or at night and, what you're those giant bags of fish you guys were catching were males. Yeah. Is, is that, is that true? Is that what yeah, you, yeah, that, that, that is true. I mean, I called, uh, you know, so I caught whatever I called 104 pounds in, in, in four days. So we're talking <laughs> about 20, we're talking about 20 smallmouth. And out of them 20 smallmouth, every single 20 of them bass were males. Um, you know, you would see a big female every once in a while cruising. Like there was, so the turning the turning point of my tournament um, was actually the second day of competition. Um, you know, the sun started to peak out. It finally started to slick off. We had a lot of wind. You know, I mean, I know, you know, people in the Northeast, you kind of know what we what happened. There was that fire up there in Canada. We had a lot of north wind. It blew a lot of that smoke, um, you know, down in, in our area, our region. So low light was really making it tough to find them deeper, deeper spawning bass. Um, but finally that left in the second day of competition, I had about two and a half hours to go look and I got out there deeper with the flogger areas where, you know, we couldn't see, you know, prior to, 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 to really that particular time. And I was able to find some really big ones. You know, I, I told one of my best buddies back at home, I was like, dude, like straight up, like, I think I can get 30. And, uh, and he, <laughs> and he, he was kind of shocked because I don't ever, I don't ever say I'm going to win a tournament. I don't ever, I don't ever really you know, sound like I'm, I'm, I'm confident or cocky. Like I just kind of like, you know, I'm a realist, you know, I know how fishing is. Uh, but man, that particular day I found three fish that were over seven pounds that I didn't catch any of them in a tournament, but that particular day I could have caught two of the three. And, uh, man, I'm just telling you, if you guys are even considering going smallmouth fishing or, or, or wanting to take a little vacation with the buddies, you got to put Cayuga on your list because that place is an absolute fish factory. It's it's the Gunnersville of the Northeast. <laughs> Pete's going to take us. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I, I will. I have a love affair with that place too, but I it, the the smallmouth have not been a factor really in any tournament that I've fished there, and uh, I I guess the addition of the gobies uh, have allowed them to explode. Yeah, I mean it has to. I mean, you look at other you know northern fisheries, even outside you know the Finger Lakes. I mean, I mean you talk about you know, like all the northern fisheries. Um, you know, it just seems like every year you're seeing bigger and bigger stringers. Tournaments are getting won with bigger weights. You know, the fish just look healthier, and you can tell. A prime example, right? So, 
we just left Cayuga or we're leaving Cayuga. Cayuga, one of the primary fords. There's a lot of outwives in Cayuga too, but there are gobies in there. But our next stop is going to be Lake St. Clair. And you put a St. Clair bass and next to a Cayuga or an Ontario bass, you, I mean, they look totally different. You know, one looks like it was caught in Tennessee and the other one looks like it was caught in New York. Well, right. St. Clair, them bass are a lot thinner. They're a lot longer. You, know, you may catch a 20 incher that weighs four pounds. You catch a 20 incher where we just were, and that sucker is over six. So a lot of it comes down to their forage. And where I'm getting at is the primary forage on St. Clair, hands down, is perch. And I just don't think they have the protein in them that really allows them fish to get big. I mean, there's a lot of people on here right now that are probably deer hunters. And you guys know what soybeans and corn and all that alfalfa does the antlers it's no different than bass whatever they're eating goes straight to their genetics and and uh that's what really makes the build of the animal yep I, and and maybe there's something about chasing perch that burns a little bit uh, of the calories too uh versus the gobies which for sure just you just vacuum clean them right up off the bottom it's yeah you know? <laughs> well all right you found these fish you, a, a lot of guys found them, but you found the bigger ones. What do you think uh, separated you? Was it uh, was it a habitat thing or a different depth zone or part of the lake? How do you think you were able to separate yourself? Yeah, so uh, kind of to give you a little history, I don't know if you talked to anybody about the tournament or not, but uh, you may have seen some stuff floating around social media. But that tournament, you know, clearly – it's not, I guess it's not clear because a lot of people overlooked it, but going into that, I was 100% committed to smallmouth. You know, I've, I fished, uh, you know, multiple tournaments for smallmouth around the spawn. Now I know, I know how susceptible they are to biting. I know how aggressive they can be. Um, and, uh, simply, you know, you hear a lot of these really good bodies of water saying like, Hey man, the only time you can really catch them is when they're spawning. And when they're spawning, the tournaments get one outside of that, you know, it's like, you can almost throw them out. Well, I committed to it and, uh, you know, I found a lot of fish, but the problem was is that the conditions weren't right for fishing deep. The conditions were right for fishing shallow. And, uh, after that first day of competition, you know, in practice, I seen like 10 boats, smallmouth fishing. And after that first day, you know, a bunch of guys, Kevin blasted 28 pounds, you know, a lot of other 25 pound bags, people started to realize you weren't competing with these smallmouth in this tournament. And that was like the turning point of the tournament for me. And I haven't even fished yet. So I'm group B. I go out there the first day of competition. I can't see there's smoke everywhere. It's cloudy. You can't see nothing. And I go out and I catch a measly 21 and a half pounds. And I'm in like <laughs> the middle of the pack. Right. So at that point in time, I realized I needed to try to do whatever I could do to get off the bank because there were so many guys that were now down there that were now trolling the bank and looking at the same fish that you already had marked um, because they were obvious because we were finding them in conditions that weren't suitable. So now that the weather's starting to break a little bit, they look like giant glow balls on the bank and they're just going down to them casting at light spots. So the right. second day of the tournament, I run through them. I catch, you know, a really good bag because I could finally see a little bit. I catch like 25 pounds. And at that point in time, I told myself, Adrian, I'm no longer fishing the bank. I'm going to get ahead and I'm going to look through this traffic cone that everybody on social media seems <laughs> to hate. And I'm just going to fish deeper than anybody else. And that's what I did. I, uh, I ran a lot of places that the wind was hitting hard early in the week that I knew I didn't have any pressure on them. And, uh, you know, I really spent a lot of my time laying on my stomach you know last night i got home and uh, i go to take off my shirt we're, we're, we're keeping a pg here i took off my shirt <laughs> and my wife says what the heck's wrong with your chest and i and i look at it in the mirror and my rib cage is black and blue because literally i spent the majority of my term at laying on my stomach over my gunnel looking through that flogger just because i knew what the potential was and i got really fortunate i found some of the right ones and and uh, that allowed me to win the tournament adrian yeah. we have a subscriber question that's asking do you use your forward facing sonar first to locate the fish and then use the flogger to confirm the size so that's a that's a really good question and i actually got i got asked that a couple times actually when i uh you know after this tournament so the thing about a, the thing about forward facing sonar and um you know people that are watching this that 
you know, fish some other bodies of water and, and, I, and uh, you know, I can almost compare it to like really cold water, right? So whenever you're fishing really cold water, the fish get super tight to the bottom because they're trying to warm up. Um, and, and the same thing, you know, like you may be on a TVA body of water and they're pulling a lot of current and you can't see the bass on the bottom because they're so tight. Um, well, the same thing with spawning bass, you know, a lot of times the spawning bass are so tight to the bottom. It's hard to differ. It's hard to tell the difference between, you know, what may be a small boulder or what may actually be a bass. Um, so for most situations, you cannot, you cannot use forward facing sonar. Um, and especially when you're throwing in Cayuga has a lot of offshore vegetation it's it's kind of hard to, to to really be able to see a clear image um so for me it was all about really using my eyes using having a good pair of polarized sunglasses on and um using that using that flogger interesting yeah that that flogger is uh you know it's famous well it's been famous it's super famous now uh i love watching <laughs> I love watching you catch one, and then the flogger just drifts away aimlessly out there in the middle while you Wilson, uh... <laughs> Wilson, yeah, yeah. A couple times, I, thought, I mean, I, I, at one time I'm not even lying. I, I got so caught up in the moment, and I and I end up letting it drift away and ran about three miles. And I go to flog my next fish, and I'm like, "Damn, where'd my cone go? <laughs> Where did that sucker go?" Yeah. Uh, no, that's 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 an awesome deal. Check it out. It's a flogger, guys. It's just it's a device that just allows you to just cut through the waves and the disturbance on the surface. What would you say, it, 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 Cayuga? What did it it, it get you? you? Could see in ten feet, in fifteen feet, and uh, so so you've been the Cayuga. You know what Cayuga is all about. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of protected water. It's really a straight shot. I mean, they call it a finger lake is essentially, you know, that's what it looks like on a map. Um, so when that wind blows, I mean, that, that sucker gets stirred up. So, I mean, if you, if you have slick calm conditions for a couple of days in a row, uh, and if you get down towards mid lake and, and the Southern part of the lake, I mean, you can actually see, you know, 15 plus feet. Uh, but that particular week, it seemed like it was blowing like every single day. Um, you know, we had a lot of in and out clouds. So, I mean, the deepest one I was able to see during the event was 12 feet. Uh, but the majority of the bass that were caught were, you know, two and a half to two and a half to six feet of water. And I do believe that has a, a, a big, um, a, a big, a big reason for that too, is it, it was probably one of the first waves um, I feel like you have a really good amount of fish that haven't spawned yet. Um, and tend, uh, you know, normally, you know, the first wave of bass is your shallowest wave. Cause that's the, you know, where the water's the warmest. Um, but you know, them, them, them cones are probably about $150 retail, but if you go on eBay right now, you can probably sell one for a grand if you got one. <laughs> I, I, and it's it's happening right now it's happening all over that part of the country and uh, you think it's still going to be happening at st Clair when you guys are there so i think um i think when it comes down to that place that place is a lot shallower um right. so it's going to be further ahead i mean i you know as soon as i uh, as soon as i got done this event uh, you know i got home last night and i you know put on youtube and i started youtube and videos and just trying to do some homework on it. And, and, uh, there's a couple guys on there that are posting, you know, them catching spawning bass back in May. Mm. Um, so them fish have been spawning for about a month now. I think what'll happen is, you know, the lake itself, they'll be done. Uh, a few of the rivers with, uh, you know, the, the, the fast moving current and the, the deeper water, you know, maybe you get up there towards Huron, you know, you're going to have some, you know, some, some cooler water coming into the system. I feel like, uh, you know, there may be some leftover spawners, you know, in those regions and in them rivers. Um, but I feel like the most of them are going to be done. Gotcha. Well, uh, the, the habitat that you were seeing these guys on, did, was that special? Like where was it on boulders? Was it on sand? What, uh, were you looking somewhere unusual for them? Um, so I would say, I would say, uh, so Cayuga is, it's got a lot of sandy banks. It's got a lot of uh, like I, I want to say it's almost like mud. It's not. It's not real hard sand. It's soft bottom. I'd say the biggest player this week uh, was your steeper banks, and by steeper I mean you know your, mm -hmm. your your banks that that almost look like false bluffs and and your riprap banks. 
Uh, those were the banks that if you were fishing shallow, um, you know, definitely were getting the most pressure and the most attention. Uh, but me personally, if, uh, you know, one of the, one of the deals that was uh, a little bit, a little bit sneakier is there's a bunch of little feeder creeks that come into the, come into Cayuga and around them, it was a lot of harder bottom. And, uh, that's really what I was focusing on. Um, and then, uh, you know, also just, uh, you know, some of these flats that had boulders on them, you know, I was really targeting, you know, them isolated boulders that just kind of gave that bass the, you know, a spot to kind of get next, next to and get comfortable and, and, and get with it. That's, that's very interesting stuff. And, uh, those little feeder creeks, that's key. I, I, I want to challenge the flogger company to make a flogger that you can use standing up. <laughs> hey. I know I, man, I'm telling you right now, you know, I named the saltwater boat improvised because I'm constantly tweaking and tinkering and trying to figure something out. And, and there's not a whole lot of things you can do with a flogger. I mean, I can promise <laughs> you because I, you know, there was a boat way back when probably, you know, a bass cap that I had probably about six years ago, I sold it to an actually another New Jersey guy, Tony Nickel. I don't know if he's watching or listening to this right now, but I actually had an uh, underwater camera installed in the rod box that you could literally idle around and watch, you know, watch your, your footage on your Lawrence graph that uh, in really, really clear water lakes, it was a big player. Uh, but, you know, you need that you need that 15, 20 foot of visibility like you do on places like the St. Lawrence River or Ontario or, you know, even Cayuga if you didn't have wind for three, four days. Um, but that's uh, that's about as close as I could figure out to being able to kind of get over that get over that hurdle of laying on your stomach with a flogger. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it's very, it's very uncomfortable. It's not a, it's not easy, especially for as many days as you guys have done it. I well, think you need an aqua view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, that, Hey, that would honestly, I mean, that would work. It's just, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, we're on our trolling motor, you know, 80, 90% wide open looking for these things and it, and it just takes it a little time to get down there you know especially if you're fishing deep well let me like i some guys might not you know like uh know how aggressive smallmouth are on the bed uh, i've seen it a few times but mm -hmm. when you're when you you were in that you were in shallow water you're literally you're fishing right on top of their beds it's it's what it looked like to me because you set the hook those fish were coming right up yeah, you were, you were literally like spot locking right on top of those things. Yeah, I mean, so a smallmouth isn't like a largemouth. You know, a largemouth, a lot of times, you know, you got to be 15, 20 feet away and you got to be making long pitches. Um, you know, the smallmouth, as long as as long as you approach the bed slowly, like in practice, you know, I'd go back to the house and, you know, I'd talk to the guys and we'd be all, you know, chit-chatting or whatever. And, you know, it's just like, oh, man, you know, I found 20 today or oh, I found 30 today, something like that. And it's just like you find a lot of bass when you're on trolling that are going really fast, but they shoot right off the bed really quick. And it's like, man, you know, you compare that to largemouth fishing and you're thinking, man, like if a largemouth leaves the bed that fast, more than likely you're not going to catch that fish. He's going to be really tough to catch. Well, smallmouth. If you approach the bed really slow, it doesn't matter if you get right on top of his head. You can still get right off of, off the top, like right over top of him. Um, it's all about just approaching him. And then, I mean, I don't know what them boys did without, uh, without you know, some version of a spot lock or a troll motor that can anchor you in a position. But that's what I would do. I mean, I would get right up on top of them. You know, they'd be they'd be five, six foot below my trolling motor. And, and once they kind of settled down, you'd look through that flogger and uh, it's like they're looking up at you. They're like, oh, you know, I'm just waiting for something to come from that. <laughs> and then as soon as you drop it down there, man, a lot of them would swim up to it and grab it. And, uh, you know, smallmouth are known for being little acrobats, man. You set the hook and they just come flying out of the water most of the time. Yeah. And these are, oh, my gosh, these are five, six pounders, man. Yep. Just coming flying out of the water, man. It was Well, the 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 baits, was, was that important to you? Was it a... a a drop shot or a, a different style? What, what was the key? Yeah, I can, I can tell you. So like just, just from experience, right. So, um, the, the two biggest predators to a bass's eggs when it comes down to these spawners is, is, a, is a goby and a perch. Um, and if you just think about it, I mean, it's, it's no, I mean, it's, you know, it's more or less common sense, but you know, when, when a bass leaves and, uh, 
you know, say he leaves, they say he chases off a bluegill or chases off a perch, chases off a goby, you know, naturally the other ones try to slide in really quick. And then it's like they run them off and that's just constant. That's just what they do all the time. And that's why, you know, they talk about, you know, a bass fan in the bed and the bed getting really bright or really light or, you know, just creating a little bit of a crater. Well, a lot of times that's the reason for it. Well, so in strategy, you kind of want a bait that's on the bottom or really close to a bottom, so to the bottom. So for me, the two primary weapons is I was throwing a, a Berkeley, a Berkeley half head quarter ounce, and I was putting a four inch gulp minnow on it. Um, and then I was also using a drop shot, but using a super short leader. Um, you know, it's typically, you know, your drop shot and you're using a, you know, 14, 16 inch leader. In this situation, I was using, you know, a three to a six inch leader, you know, getting that bait really close to where I, kind of envision the eggs to be or, or you know where that bass was really protecting and uh that was definitely key um another thing is is color um i was using chartreuse back which was a gulp minnow with a chartreuse back white belly being able to have a visual being able to see that bait uh whenever you know them bass were really starting to get um uh, really protective of it really allowed me to be able to uh to be more efficient um, but that was, that was really the deal for me. Excellent. Jocelyn, I see you laughing over there. What's going on on the IM so, board? So Adrian, I know you use a flogger, but I have to give a shout out to our subscriber, Blake Valley. Cause he said, Pete follows the motto to catch the fish. You have to be one with the fish with goggles and a snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, hey, that was a, that was actually a joke. So, uh, so Jacob, Jacob Wheeler, you know, a good buddy of mine, he, you know, of course we travel together and, and, uh, you know, all this stuff starts flying on social media. Well, we're in a little group text thread and, uh, and he, he was, he was just saying basically, oh, let, let, let them boys ban the flogger. We'll be out there with a snorkel mask and goggles and we'll just be going underwater just with our heads plunged and still making it happen because I'm telling you guys, it really does make that big of a difference. You know, I know there's a lot of people that are, uh, that, that are just maybe maybe a little biased towards not having it. Um, but in order to, to compete against the best guys, in order to put yourself in a position to win these national tournaments, you need to do whatever it takes. And, and using a flogger um, is not against the rules. You know, it's within the rules. Um, and, uh, you know, anymore it's like going out and, and fishing without forward-facing sonar um, in a forward-facing sonar tournament. So um, you're really going to, you know, hinder your performance if you don't. Uh, do whatever is necessary. And, and for me, um, you know, having that flogger was necessary. It's funny you say that because uh, years ago, Roland Martin was uh, would pre-fish Thousand Islands with a snorkel and a mask. <laughs> <laughs> but this is back before they were big, you know, when a two and a half pounder was a good fish, you know. Yep. But Yeah, I heard of guys doing that, even on the St. Lawrence River, just kind of floating with the current. Mm -hmm. and doing that you know years ago um i mean shoot it would be something i would actually enjoy doing because gosh dang i love snorkeling and uh i can see how efficient that would be except for the except for the cold water That's oh yeah yeah hey, hey yeah you're talking <laughs> about 60 degrees hey i i jumped in you fall in uh 50 some degree water and i'll tell you one thing i if i'm doing that again i can promise you it's not in a bathing suit and a, and a, and a sun shirt it's with a wetsuit on <laughs> 60 degrees is cold 50s uh that that'll get you well let, let me uh let me ask you this because there was some controversy about this tournament yep. um and uh the i remember when major league fishing well, every fish counts came out we were talking about you know oh man if it's a spawning tournament, you know, they could catch fish over and over and over again and they would count, you know, and that was, I think the original rule. I don't know the rule, but the, some guys were talking about, I, I think now this is all hearsay from what I've heard, but the oh, yeah. is the rule. Well, tell me what the rule is like, cause the, can you catch the same fish uh, multiple times in a day or do you have to wait to the next day? What is the rule now on this? So, um, the rule, uh, let me see. I can actually, I don't know. Can I, oh. am I still on here? Yep. We lost it for a second. Oh, so I actually have it in my phone cause I've read it like 50 times cause a bunch of people asking me the same thing, but the rule, the rule essentially states you're not allowed to, so they're trying to protect the bass from being caught twice. However, they don't want you to catch the bass twice 
and feel like you did something wrong. So the rule essentially is you're not allowed to target the same bass sight fishing twice. So uh, there were guys from the sounds of it that caught the same bass twice in the tournament, but they weren't visually sight fishing it. And per our rule, um, you know, it's a super gray area, but uh, I mean, as I read the rule, it seems as if it is okay. Uh, but now there were guys that just simply just stayed away from it because they didn't want any parts of that. Um, you know, like myself, there were, there were bass that were really easy to be caught that I did catch every single day, but I just simply would not go to them multiple times throughout the day because it's just not ethical. Yeah, I see in the, the rule it says when sight fishing, vis visibly targeting bass, anglers cannot weigh the same bass more than once per day. It Catching the same bass while sight fishing more than once per day and weighing it more than once per day may result in loss of weight, loss of fishing time, a fine, and any other penalty. So that that's a that's a scary one. You don't want to. It, it really it really is, you know. And 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 man, you know, there's stuff floating around that you know guys uh, guys may have try to work their way around that rule um but it's 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 really tough you know it's it, it was it was a it was a tough deal on major league fishing it's a tough deal on the anglers and 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 of course you know we're going there at a time that that season really isn't open to the public yet you know there's there's tournaments out there that are having paper tournaments and kayak tournaments that are doing you know their their inch measurement tournaments um, and, and of course we're out there, you know, catch way release, just catching them and letting them go, you know? So we were definitely, um, we definitely weren't wrong for being there. We were, of course we were allowed to be there. Um, but it's just, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, there were some guys in this tournament that, uh, that may, that may have kind of tried to get around that by casting to a light spot, you know, not visually seeing that bass, but casting to a light spot, catching that fish. Um, and then later on, you know, actually sight fishing that bass, uh, because per the rule, technically, you know, that isn't against it. Right. Yeah. It's like the old NASCAR thing. Whoever cheats the best win, kind of thing. You it's, know? Uh, man, it, it's one of them deals where, you know, in, in tournament fishing and, and Pete, you know, this too, I mean you got to understand the rules better than anybody else because mm -hmm. the guy that is flirting and with that, with that role and the guy that's really taking every, every little bit of information or every little, you know, nugget or, 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 or just a, a way to get an edge on the competitors. You know, it seems like those are the guys that, that, that do win tournaments or put themselves in position to win tournaments. Um, so it, it definitely was, uh, it definitely was a little, a little weird. It, yeah, it, it is. And I think about it, you know, because, you know, you're reading the rule and you, you, you're you trying to you're trying to do the best that you can for yourself and still adhere to the rules. Because I don't think anybody genuinely wants to go out there and 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 cheat, you know, right. We all but you want to push things like you want to fish right up to the, the off limits zone. You know, you're going to you're going to put your boat as close to it as you can. Oh, you, for sure. If you feel like it's going to benefit you or give you a chance to catch a fish, um, you know, and, and that's we have to push it as anglers. And, uh, you know, that that's kind of a, 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 a crazy rule because I'm I'm watching Adrian Avina catch six pounder after six pounder. And I know there's a six pounder over, over there that I've already caught. Uh I, you know, man, I, I could, I see where the, the temptation is and, uh, and the pressure to, to, to maybe push the envelope a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, it's good that we have officials. It's good that we have camera people, um, you know, because it definitely, it definitely keeps, you know, things honest, um, or as at least honest as they can be. Um, but that, that was definitely a unique tournament. It was a, it was a unique circumstance and, um, I'm just, I'm just really fortunate, man, that, you know, I was just doing something a little bit different than other people. You know, there weren't a whole lot of guys out there fishing deep and, and, uh, it just seemed like that's where the better quality was. And, and, uh, you know, I was just fortunate to be able to, to find them, you know, six to, to, to six and a half pounders because it, that's just was gold, 
you know, and, and, um, you know, of, of course, uh, you know, it, it allowed me to, to get that first win. Well, that's, that was a great win. Uh, Justin, what do you got? Yeah. So Blake wants to know what size weight were you going with on your drop shot? And, and do you think the color of the weight matters when fishing for those bedding smallies? Uh, man, not really. You know, I, I think, uh, the, the only issue that I, that I have had in the past, and, and it's not really for bedding fish, but using a unpainted traditional, like say if you're using lead or if you're using tungsten, the shiny color, like I've actually had bass eat the weight. Yeah. Um, so yeah. me personally, I try to shy away from, you know, the shiny weights. Um, you know, I typically just use, uh, you know, just black weights and, and in that particular situation, I was using three eighths ounce. Um, and it's just a tungsten teardrop weight, you know, nothing real special about it. Uh, but just the big deal was just using short leaders and, and, uh, I was actually threading that minnow. So I was using just a, a one out straight shank, you know, it got the hook, uh, you know, back into the bait a little bit. So for those, you know, for those bass that wanted to just either nip at it or eat half the bait, you know, there was a good chance that you know, that hook was going to be in their mouth and I could, you know, I could then set the hook on them. Great cool. question. Cool yep. And, uh, man, great stuff, Adrian. It's just so amazing. What a, what a great win. And, uh, you know, on a really just a, a seemed like a record setting pace of just, just giant, giant bass. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just thrilled for you. It was fun to watch. And, uh, you know, I think now that you got this, this one, uh, I guess, kind of off your back, you know. I think uh, I think you're going to find it a lot easier to get into that winter circle now. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> 12 years was a long time to wait for one, but you know, I'll tell you one thing. It's um, you know, we talked about it before. I've been on the show a few times. You know, I won a tournament when I was 20 years old. It was the first ever tournament that I fished, and it seems like you and I, Pete, we've got similar similar history when it comes down to bodies of water that we've done well on, but. You know, I won a tournament on Champlain, and I'm not saying I didn't appreciate it when I was 20 years old, but let me just tell you, 12 years later, fishing a lot of tournaments and not <laughs> winning and to finally get one, you appreciate it a lot more. Um, but I really don't want to wait that he's long. He's going to win a tournament now, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> That's that you're, you're on. We're on the same plan. Like every 10 years or so, I get a W. That's how. Are you, are you fishing? What isn't there one on Champlain next week? Uh, yeah, the Toyota's up there. Unfortunately, I'm, I won't be in that one, but I'll, okay. I'll be, I'll be up at thousand islands trying to make a flogger work. Uh, sweet. You know, and, when, when, it'll when's, be that, July. when's that tournament start? It's July, like okay. second week of July. Okay. You know, yep. um, I'll have, I'll have a bruised rib cage. Of course, I, <laughs> I don't know if they'll be spawning that time of year, but we'll, we'll be up there getting after it and, uh. Well, you know, I just, I just love it. This is, this is win number two, man. It was great that you, uh, you got the W. It was, was awesome that you took some time to hang with us. Are you at home now, or are you, are you still? Yeah, on I'm the actually, road? I'm actually sitting in my truck. My boat's right there. Uh, it's windy. It's windy here in South Jersey, so I didn't want, I didn't want you guys to, you know, think I was in some windstorm over here. But, uh, you know, I'm just sitting in my truck. We're actually having a party at my parents' house. Well, oh. We lost you there for a second. You were you you were saying you're about to have a party at your parents' house. Am I there? Or am I still here? Yeah, we we got you. You're you're oh. back for us. Yes, yeah, so I just uh, man, we're having a party tonight, having a bunch of people at the house and and uh, just celebrating a little bit, you know. We'll see you there. <laughs> hey, hey real quick tip, real quick tip for you though pete i, I didn't uh, i didn't know this tip so I, I figured i'd share it with you to kind of save your rib cage but uh if you do decide to flog somebody after the tournament told me that i needed to go get one of them thick yoga mats and you lay the yoga mat over your gunnel so if you do decide to lay on your gunnel you're not messing with fiberglass uh, i really wish i, I knew that you. trick because uh yeah we're black and blue right now that's a great tip. That's that's an awesome tip. Thanks thanks for that one. Yeah, uh, appreciate appreciate that. And I, man, it was great that your family was there. I know you had some friends and family that came up and were on the water watching and cheering you on. And and now you're going to have a well deserved uh, celebration at home, man. And and congratulations again. And and thanks so much, man. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. 
we'll be rooting for you on the next one. The champ, Adrian Avina, everybody. Congratulations. What a deal. W, the big dub. It's your turn now. Yes, I'm due. I'm due. It's been uh, it's been too long. I, of course, you know, I thought it was going to happen at the Chesapeake, but Jocelyn pushed me in, <laughs> greased the skids, something. But um, we'll uh, we'll get we'll get back around to it. We got some prizes to give away, guys. Uh, do we do we want to take a quick break? Uh, we can. Let's take a quick break. Okay. We're going to put together a trivia question. We'll be right back in just like a minute or so, guys, and we'll be giving away some cool stuff. Portland Line Master Braid, America's premium super braided fishing line. Manufactured in our Cortland, New York facility and constructed from the highest quality spectra fibers available. Cortland Line Company, made in America since 1915. I have to have the best eyewear. My eyes are essential to doing my job. It's the highest quality lens that I've ever used. Top of the line performance in these glasses. But they're priced for absolutely everyone. The everyday angler can afford them. As a touring professional pro, if I can depend on them, I know the weekend angler can as well. Hobie Eyewear, built for the pros. Price for everyone. What's going on? It's Riz here from the Bash University, and I am excited to welcome in Waterwood Custom Baits to the Bashu family. These are custom handmade baits in the south rainforest of Brazil. They're made of Marupa Pedra wood. It's extremely dense, it's resistant, but it's also really buoyant. They're made of quality components with a 100% guarantee. They're made for tournament anglers, to get it done when the money is on the line. Guys, that was like my second cast with this bait. That's a Waterwood custom bait. These things are handmade in the rainforest south of Brazil. And I mean, as you can see right here, it's a fish catching bait. It's got the front hook. That means they wanted it. This bait's, uh, it, it's running really true. It throws really well. Guys, check them out at waterwoodcustombaits.com. underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for. Catch more fish. Have more fun. Aquaview. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rods? I'm truly losing less fish. Is the sensitivity of the rod. That they're made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% bait. We're back. Welcome back. Uh, we want, last chance to like and share, guys. Uh, Father's Day. It's it's this weekend. The best gift is the gift of learning, and that comes with a subscription to Bash University. So get it for yourself. Get it for your father, for uh, any anybody that would love to learn bass fishing. This is going to be a great gift. It's going to be one that's really going to help them. They're going to love it. And it comes with a couple of great Spro Frogs, a Bass University hat, and a $25 coupon to Tackle Direct. What an amazing gift for Father's Day. So go check it out. Get yourself signed up at Bashu.tv. And, uh, and he, get yourself who, who some of that are you stuff. releasing this Thursday? Speaking of frogs. Speaking of frogs is is really an amazing um, release that we're thrilled to work with uh, Dean Rojas. 
the the master really of the hollow belly frog and the designer of the spro bronze eye frog and you know just really at the upper echelon in, in the world if, if you're talking about who are the best frog fishermen on the planet he's in that conversation is in the top three for sure if not the number one guy and we're going to be releasing his very detailed and, and complex seminar about how he fishes all the varieties of frogs uh that he uses and that's that's going to be released on thursday in association with our frog days of summer and his father's day special so that's going to be coming on thursday guys do not miss that must watch frogs and watch the dean row must must watch you want to definitely check that out um and we got uh we got a lot of other great stuff coming at bash university uh Mm -hmm. tv as always Guys, if you're a kayak guy, we've got a lot of guys that are in the kayak. Uh, they love to experience bass fishing through a kayak, and we have released Kayak Bass University. And, uh, you know, want to check that out. We've got a, another new release coming on Friday uh, for Kayak Bass University. And you, if you're a kayak guy, you want to sign up through bassu.tv backslash kayak because you can get yourself a custom Kayak Bass University hat there as well as a great tackle pack. So there's some stuff going on over there that you definitely want to go check out. And <laughs> we, did, we did have a subscriber that I saw on the message board. I think it was Mr. Diggs, Diggs mm-hmm. who um, he fell out of his kayak. And he <laughs> said he went through the first stage of hypothermia. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, that's that's the big that's the big scares. You got to you got to watch out for uh, for hypothermia. But water's getting warm now. We're not going to have to worry about that too much these days. But if you whether you want to subscribe through the kayak end of Bash University, you still get access to all the content that's delivered over at BashU.tv. So go check it out, guys. Right now, uh, we have a like we're going to ask a trivia uh, question where it's really not trivia but it's a question based on what was talked about here at the show and uh Stephen browning we're going back to mr browning talking about the chatterbait he talked about a lot of stuff in his gear his blade sizes his trailers the line he uses the rod what is his preferred gear ratio for fishing a chatterbait that's the question and that that will what are they going to win Jocelyn. Chatter baits and some Cortland line. All right. Braided line. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, excellent prize. And we also have a like and share winner, Joss. <laughs> um, yeah. Ricky Brewer is the like and share winner. Thanks for liking and share it, Ricky. As our team is over there. We yeah. have a trivia winner. And it's not Dan Allen. It's Chad. <laughs> Dan came in a close second, second. place. <laughs> uh, uh, Dan, sorry. you were so close. I know. Since I've been since I've been outing, Dan is the champion of this uh, uh, this Dan, prize. Dan, what should have been our trivia question was what reel and gear ratio was mm. the reel? Because uh, later on, Dan came back in. He's got the lose tournament pro seven five one, giving all the details. Oh man, but. Dan probably knows what pound drag and everything's on that reel, but well, he came in second. Sorry, he, Dan. He's the man. <laughs> Nick Mayberry said, Dan, you guys are past. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> well, congratulations, guys. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank, thank you very much, Stephen Browning uh, and Adrian Avina uh, for both hanging out with us today. Really appreciate that. And you can look for us right back here for another episode of Bash University Live next Tuesday. Have a great day.